Okay. Okay. The following interview was conducted with uh, LA Professor L.A. Gaddis Sherwater, Distinguished Professor of Purdue University, for the Purdue University Oral History Program. It took place on Wednesday, February the 22nd, 2007, in the Weldon School of Biomedical Engineering. The interviewer is Catherine Marquis, the Oral History Librarian, and also sitting in is his wife, Linnell Geddes. Welcome. Tell us a little bit about where you were born and your parents and siblings in your early years. I was born in Scotland, in the Highlands of Scotland, and uh, came over to Canada in 1926 and uh, attended school there uh, in, in a little town called St. Lambert, which is a suburb of Montreal, and uh, attended school there and then attended college, McGill University in Montreal, and uh, graduated with a BS in electrical engineering. I took my MS in electrical engineering, and then in 1952, I graduated in 45. In 1952, I, I left uh, Montreal and went to Baylor Medical College in Houston, Texas. And I was there from 1952 to 1974. In 74, I came to Purdue at, at, to uh, head the biomedical engineering program. <clears throat> and uh, uh, I retired officially in 1991, but I'm still working and teaching and doing research. Um. Tell us, in your early years in, uh, at college, how did you happen to, what developed your interest in electrical engineering? Oh, I, I had an uh, interest in electric radio since I was the age of six. I was building crystal sets, and, I, and in 1935, I became the youngest amateur radio operator in Canada. I had a radio station called VE2LR, and I was on the air from 1935 to 1939. In 1939, we had to go off the air because the war came to Canada in 1939. And uh, then I was in, I, I was in the service uh, and at college at the same time. And I resi res resigned my commission in 1945 when I graduated. And then I took a position in the Montreal Neurological Institute uh, in, in doing research in neurophysiology. Uh -huh. And what, how did you, what, how did you happen to get to then go to Baylor, what made your decision to decide to go there? They, they twisted my arm for two years and they wanted me to come down and <clears throat> they knew I was doing electrophysiology. They wanted me to go down there and do electrophysiology. And at that time, <clears throat> 1952, the polio epidemic was very uh, big in, in Houston, Texas, where Baylor College of Medicine is. And uh, I, they wanted me to build a laboratory for for diagnosing uh, the, the, the uh, degree of impairment that polio patients had and work in rehabilitation. Also, I was teaching, uh, took my PhD in physiology, and then I, and then I became a professor of physiology and uh, taught physiology at, at the same time. Okay. What was it, McGill, did you um, live on campus? Tell us a little bit about your days in, in college in, in uh, McGill. Did you live on well, at McGill, I was at McGill from 1941 to 1945. I lived uh, on the campus. Uh, I lived at a, at a, in a fraternity house, and uh, McGill has about 6,000 students on, on the, in, the, in the downtown campus. And it has all, all faculties, uh, including medicine, veterinary medicine, nursing, law, architecture, engineering, uh, physics, chemistry, and social sciences, too. And while I was at McGill, I, I was in the, in the Army. I was in the service. I, I, I became a, a military engineer uh, as well as an electrical engineer. And uh, the summer times, I used to go to camp and teach bridge building and bridge demolition and uh, got, uh, got great training in, 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 in uh, military engineering from a, a World War I veteran who had one leg, and he was an expert in demolitions, and uh, he taught me a great deal. And I had some remarkable teachers at, at McGill. Uh, it was uh, interesting. They, uh, they would just would not be stopped uh, in, in what they wanted to do. Uh, for example, one of the uh, fellows wanted to uh, keep the, the port of Montreal open all year. And he, he was a professor of chemistry and he invented thermite, which is, which is like uh, uh, incendiary bombs, magnesium. And just to prove that he could do it, he melted all the snow on the campus at, at Christmas time. 
And there were other people who were doing remarkable things too, and, and, and it was just great fun to be around people who just were, were going to do what they were we wanted to do and did it very well. Mm -hmm. That's interesting that you were uh, in school and in the military at the same time. Mm -hmm. Yes. How, how does that work? Because sometimes you can't do both, but you were able to do it. Did you have to go any for camps in the summer? Or yes, yes. Uh, I was just a very busy guy. I, I worked on the weekends. I was in in, in the uh, on, on duty and military duty, and uh, during the week I uh, attended college, and uh, had had parades every twice a week in addition. So I was a real busy guy. Okay. Well, I asked you earlier about your children. Do you have any brothers or sisters? And no. Were your parents were no. also from Scotland too, and then they came over? Yes, my father was a was a uh, uh, he was in the Royal Royal Flying Corps uh, in World War One and. Uh, then he, after that, he uh, became a, a, a lumber merchant in Scotland, and he married my mother, and, and I was born in 1921. And uh, he, he came over to Canada after, uh, long before uh, we came to Canada, and he was out in, uh, in uh, Alberta. Uh, and uh, then he, he was a mason, and, uh, uh, and then he came to Montreal, I was in Calgary, and then he came to Montreal and he worked for the Northern Electric Company, which is the equivalent of the Western Electric Company. They made telephones. And he did all kinds of things. Uh, he was in the special products department, and they made uh, radios and traffic lights and telephones and things like that. And he brought, me, brought, brought home to me after we came to uh, Montreal in 1926. He was well established, and he brought me uh, components, radio components and things like that. And I, that's how I got to be tinkering with uh, electronics at that time. It wasn't called electronics, it was called radio at that time. And yet we were in the head of station then. Yes. One thing, what prompted them to leave Scotland and come to Canada? Was there any, did you have relatives there? Or? No, uh, they, they say a smart Scotsman will uh, squeeze his pennies and leave, uh, leave uh, Scotland uh, for one of the colonies because you can make a better living in the colonies like Australia, South Africa, Canada, New Zealand, uh, uh, and so on. I see. Okay. And then at, uh, after you got your um, degree at, at Baylor, you stayed on there. One of the things that I read that you were involved in while you were in Texas was a consultant for the Manned Space Center. Yes. Can you tell us a little bit about that? That was very interesting. Uh, <clears throat> they, uh, the first, uh, the first uh, uh, space flight, uh, they uh, had uh, difficulty with uh, recording, measuring respiration on the astronauts. So they had a, a, a had a um, microphone in front of his mouth, and and they had a little heated element. And when the uh, astronaut exhaled, the heated element got co cooled down. But when he turned his head like that, uh, they lost respiration. They came to me at Baylor and said, "Hey, can you make a, a, a respiration uh, system that uh, won't have that?" Uh, failure, and I said anybody could make a, a respiration system that doesn't have that failure. So one Saturday afternoon, I went to the lab and put electrodes across my chest here and here, and I measured the conductivity through the uh, through the chest. <clears throat> and when you inspire, air comes in, and 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 the, uh, the the chest expands, and the electrodes move outward, and that decreases the conductivity. And when you exhale. The air goes out, and the electrodes come together, and, and air is a poor conductor. And the air goes out, the con conductivity is better. So we, we d designed that and built the prototypes for NASA at the medical school. And uh, then I realized that the heart was between the electrodes, and I could get the electrocardiogram from the same pair of electrodes. <clears throat> and uh, that, we, that we published uh, and, uh, in aerospace medicine uh, the following year. And uh, that is the method that is used in all patient monitors now to, to measure respiration and the ECG. And then they, uh, <clears throat> they, they, they had trouble making uh, blood pressure measurements. Uh, and so I des designed a blood pressure cuff that had a microphone inside it. And so you wouldn't have to use a stethoscope or put a microphone in, in, underneath the cuff. And so I designed that and uh, the industry. Uh, I think it was uh, St. Louis, uh, I've forgotten which, uh, the, the aircraft company in St. Louis uh, took over the d design and building of, of the respiration monitor, and another company on the west coast took over the, the space uh, space uh, blood pressure system. <clears throat> and the first unit they couldn't use on the on the flight. It was on a Gemini flight. They couldn't use it because it was they couldn't get it through the the, the astronaut and the uh, and the uh, 
device, they couldn't get it through the hatch, so they had to redesign it and make, make a smaller unit. But the, the system fl flew on the, uh, on, the, on the second Mercury flight, all of the stuff that I designed flew on, on the second Mercury flight, the second Gemini flight, rather. And uh, then I was consultant. I reviewed grant applications that they received and uh, gave a te technical opinion on them. Did you, you ever kept in touch with it? Did you meet some of the astronauts when you were down there? Yes, it was a very interesting thing. <clears throat> well, I, I met some of the astronauts, and I met there were there were five medical monitors, and uh, we had a, a meeting with them uh, after the first uh, first uh, second uh, Mercury flight. We met with them. They were located in picket ships and in different countries throughout the world, and we asked them. I said, uh, um, we, we worked hard on this monitoring system. We got electrocardiogram, respiration, blood pressure, and body temperature. And I asked them, I said, what, uh, what uh, physiological event gave you the, mes the most information? They want, they, the, the question was, when do you abort a flight? Uh, if, uh, can, can you tell how the physiological condition of the astronaut well enough to, to, to abort a flight? So I asked, I said, which, which of the channels gave you the best, most information? There was dead silence, absolute dead silence. Thought, gosh, there's something wrong here. I said, "Come on now, tell me. We 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 know, we want to know." And they said, "None of them." I said, "What do you mean, none of them?" I said, "How did you how did you know whether the flight could be continued or not? If, if they, how, did you, how did you know the astronaut was in good condition?" They said, "We we trained with the astronauts and we learned the way they answered questions that we would ask. We, the, the speed with which they would answer them, the speed with which they would talk, that told us a lot about them." So that was a little bit deflating. Yeah, well, interesting. <laughs> Have you kept in touch with any of them over, the, over time? Or, uh, did you meet, ever meet Neil Armstrong? No, I didn't meet Neil Armstrong. He came in after. I was, I was uh, involved in the first uh, 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 of the astronauts. There was a lady astronaut, uh, too, but she never flew. Okay. Okay. Um, now, how did, let's talk a little bit about your career at Purdue. How did you... Uh, happened to come to Purdue, and you brought some of, I guess, some colleagues along with you? <clears throat> yes. Uh, 1972, they had uh, received a, a showalter, uh, an endowed chair, <clears throat> and they were looking for somebody, <clears throat> excuse me, to fill the chair, and Bob Greenhorn, the associate dean, came down uh, to Baylor and told me about the opportunity. Uh, I was one of the candidates, and they had a nationwide search. And I said, well, thank you, but no thank you. I've got a great program here. I had uh, technicians, I had laboratory facilities, operating room, and uh, <clears throat> uh, animals, and uh, just I had everything I wanted. And I said, forget it. And, and uh, then they came back and <clears throat> said, we'd like you to consider it. And they, they, they narrowed the, the field down to one candidate, and I was the candidate. <clears throat> and I said, no, I don't want to go. I, I got the too good here. And so they said, well, come up and see us. So <clears throat> I said, well, if you want a real program, I to, I'm going to have to bring some people with me. I'm going to have to bring Dr. Borland, who is my, he was taking his Ph.D. at that time, and he was <clears throat> my engineer, and uh, Dr. Tacker, who, uh, who had just got his M.D., and I, I was on his Ph.D. committee. Uh, I, I said, I would like to bring him. <clears throat> I'd like to bring a veterinarian, Dr. Rossborough. He said, well, we'll, we'll, we'll locate them. Don't, don't worry. So we came up and uh, met uh, quite a few people, and uh, they were all very friendly, and we came, came back, and uh, I said, should, should we leave? And I said, I don't want to leave. And others said, well, if you're not going to leave, we're not going to leave. <clears throat> so they came, the dean came down to see me, uh, Dean Hancock, and he came down to Leslie. I'd like, like you to consider this very, very seriously. So we came back up again, and Dr. Rossberg decided not to come, so Borland and Tacker and I came up to... Uh, Purdue, and uh, they interviewed us again, and we saw some different people, department heads and things like that, and uh, Tacker says, uh, uh, they're not going to give up. We've got to make a decision. And so they, I said, well, how do you feel about it? They said, we'd like to come. What we'll do is we'll give you two years of our life. We may stay longer, but we'll, we'll guarantee that we'll be with you for two years. So we decided in, in, in the spring of 74, and we came up in the fall of 1974, and, and Dr. Babs, he just got his MD. He, he liked what we were doing at Baylor, so he came with us. So Tacker, Borland, and Babs, uh, and, and uh, myself came, and we had 
uh, we had wives who were professional uh, professionals. For example, Dr. Tacker's wife was a PhD in medical biochemistry, and they had to help her get a position. Uh, Dr. Borland's wife was a pediatric cardiologist, and they fixed her up. And, and my wife didn't come with me because she had a teaching obligation, so she came up the next year, and she uh, joined the nursing school, became head a little while later. And so uh, they're, they're all still here. And uh, backtracking has been at Baylor. Did you do some teaching when you were down there, or was it, was it a combination of research and teaching when you were at Baylor? Both uh, research and teaching. I taught the medical school students physiology, and I was in charge. And we built the physiology laboratory. It was. It was. Uh, we made it all electronic. We made it like a, like the, the equipment you'd see in a hospital now. And it was. A, it was. A, we had television in, in every every uh, laboratory room. We had two-way communication. And we had a demonstration system whereby we could broadcast uh, electrical signals from the patients and from the, from animals to, from, to station to station. It was quite an installation. Mm -hmm. Now, some of the research that you had started there, you, do, you brought that along with you at the same time. Yes, as a matter of yes, as a matter of fact, I did. <clears throat> I had a large NIH grant on on cardiac fibrillation and defibrillation, and I brought that, and uh, we we um, then. When we, are, when we were, uh, arrived here, we went out and got some more money to continue that research and broaden it. So it's a, it was a continuum. Mm -hmm. okay. Well, now that you've arrived, and well, first thing as a director in your show out, or uh, distinguished professor, what was the initial focus of your research? And you probably had to get some organization going on the center. Well, you, you asked a very interesting question. <clears throat> when. Uh, when uh, we got here, they gave me a quarter of a million dollars to get the Biomedical Engineering Center started. <clears throat> and um, the first thing we, we did was to s sit down. And we, and our, our quarters in the Double E building weren't uh, complete at, at that time, so we had our first meeting at the Holiday Inn on, on uh, 43 North, and we, des we decided that we, uh, we were going to need money. That $250,000 won't last very long. We need some money, so we sat, we assigned ourselves tasks uh, to write grants. We all wrote five grant applications, and uh, at that time, the, the good funding uh, sources were NASA, National Science Foundation, National Institutes of Health, and industry. And so we we wrote grants to all of those, and we got severely criticized for <clears throat> writing grants to industry because uh, uh, that was technology. That's not science. Uh, and now that it's, it's very it's very different now, but we we did very well with industry, and we got a huge grant from the army uh, to make a uh, make a monitoring system for soldiers on the chemical battlefield, and we we were able to make it a system. They were all covered in rubber suits, and you couldn't open the, the suit in on the, on the battlefield because the, the soldier would be contaminated and die. So we built a telemetry system that would go through the suit, and we could. We could measure respiration and heart rate and, uh, and body temperature mm -hmm. without, without opening the, the chemical suit. In the organization of the center, about how many people did, did you, if you had to get the staff in addition to the people that came with you? Yes, uh, the, first, the first two employees what were the, uh, a secretary. We hired a secretary to start with. And then the first two employees were uh, Bill Schoenlein and Jim Jones, and they're still with me. And then we, we picked up a few technicians uh, here and there. We hired a lot of undergraduate and graduate students, and uh, a lot of them stayed with me after they graduated. Um, and one of the quotes you said, research is like peeling an onion, right? Yes. <laughs> yes, it's <laughs> like... That's a good quote. <laughs> yes, it's like, uh, like peeling an onion. You're peeling off the layers of ignorance and crying all the time. Until you get to the to the middle and to the, the middle. yeah, and then and then you're finished peeling. Okay. Mm -hmm. Let me uh, we talk a little bit about uh, some of the research projects that areas that you've been involved in and how they sort of changed or the focus or you know, tell us a little bit about some of the things that you share with the researchers who are going to mm -hmm. be using the transcript. Well, uh, the first research project we had uh, when we were in Double E <coughs> was uh, well, we continued the de the fibrillation defibrillation studies. But uh, we got an interesting uh, call from a, a company called New Dimensions in Medicine in Dayton, <clears throat> and they had built a new electrode for electrosurgery. And electrosurgery uses a big electrode and a, a small electrode to, to cut and coagulate tissue. And they had built a, the idea is that, that all of the action is at the small electrode. 
a little flame occurs there, but there should be no action at all or no heating under uh, the dispersive electrode or the indifferent electrode. And uh, they had designed and built one, and, and they thought it was great, but they couldn't test it. <coughs> they came to us and said, could you test it? And we said, yes, we'll measure, the, we'll map the temperature underneath it. We had an infrared camera uh, like, the, uh, like the Army uses now, and we uh, put the electrode on and passed current through it for a minute and uh, took the electrode off and mapped the, the, the temperature rise, the, the distribution of temperature. And, uh, of course, they asked us to uh, test a competitor's electrode, and their new design was no better than the competitor's electrode. And they went back home and uh, fired a few people and redesigned their electrode, and we got it back and uh, uh, tested it, and it, it, it was a whole lot better. And uh, they, they, they had, they had, a, they had a, a monopoly on the, on the, uh, the electrode design for quite a few years. Is that company still in business? Yes, it was bought twice. Been bought twice now. It's bought. It's, it's owned by one of the big drug companies, but they're still in business in Dayton. Right. Yeah. <clears throat> okay. What were some of the other? You've done some work with a lot of work with your cardiology. And yes. So part one, is sort of a focal point. one of the interesting things <laughs> that we did was uh, Neil Fearnot, who was uh, he got his PhD, got his master's, and his PhD with me. He is president of uh, uh, and C chief executive officer of. Med Institute, which is a cook company, and uh, I assigned him the task of uh, imaging the heart from within the esophagus. And uh, he built a, a, a mechan electromechanical scanner, and uh, uh, we put it down the esophagus and uh, it scan at different different levels. And uh, he uh, then, uh, to, to prove that we uh, we could see the organs, uh, we took um, uh, sonograms, and then he froze a dog and cut it into slices and then we matched the, the, sli the ultrasound slice with the anatomical slice. And they are one for one. We applied to NIH twice for funding and they said, no, we don't need that. We can image from uh, the chest. Well, there are only two places you can image the heart from the chest. There's one at the suprasternal notch and the other is at the, at the left anterior chest. And with the esophageal scanner, you can, you can see the whole heart and, and its valves and NIH that did not fund it twice, and uh, we, uh, we uh, uh, finished the project and couldn't get industry interested, uh, and uh, so uh, uh, we wrote a paper and uh, sent an abstract to, to a fellow in Japan, I've forgotten what his name is, uh, forgotten what his name is. Anyway, very soon there was a Japanese ultrasonic esophageal scanner. And now they're a standard thing uh, that you, that is used to uh, image the heart. Mm -hmm. uh, what are some of the other? You did some work with the uh, one of the things that you got the patent was that PAM, the per personal personal arrhythmia uh, monitor. Yes. Uh, well, we we got the idea that uh, that uh, the stethoscope will tell you what what the heart is doing, and but it doesn't tell you why it's doing what it's doing. So you need electrocardiograph to, to, to see that, and that's the electrical activity of the heart. And the electrical activity of the heart is like the current in your spark plug. It's the trigger for the explosion. It's a trigger for the contraction. It doesn't tell you anything about the dynamics, but it tells you the timing of the events of the cardiac cycle. So we decided we would make a uh, pocket size uh, uh, electrocardiograph with a liquid crystal display. and. Uh, I decided that uh, this was so so unusual that I had to build a model to, to, to make people believe that it could be done. So we built a model and we took it down to uh, Indianapolis and there was a government funding agency, state funding agency called the Corporation for Science and Technology at that time. I took it down to the scientific uh, meeting uh, that they had and they looked at it. Dr. Beering, the, the uh, past president that was on the committee and he liked it and everybody liked it and they funded me and <clears throat> we built uh, we built uh, three of them uh, then Med Institute took, uh, took over building them and they made a dozen and uh, then uh, uh, IBM had a training program here for microelectronics and, and they built a dozen so we sent them out around the country and uh, then they were they were we, they were greatly popular with emergency medicine physicians and uh, the emergency people at, uh, at Methodist Hospital 
uh, they have a, have a helicopter there, a, a helipad on the roof, and uh, the, the, the attendants, uh, medical attendants in the evacuation unit like them. The physical, the physical uh, therapists like them, and, and uh, the anesthesiologist like them, and uh, the cardiologists weren't keen on them at all. And I gave one to my, my personal physician, uh, Dr. James Poulos, and he looked at it and he said, gee, that's keen. He says, but every time I use it, it's going to cost me $25. I said, what? He said, yes, it'll cost me $25. And explain that to me. He says, well, I, when I want an ECG, I order it, <clears throat> and the technician takes it, and I read the ECG. I get paid $25 for every ECG that I read. He says, now I wouldn't have to do that. But he, uh, he took it and he used it. He, he liked it. It's, it's, it's small enough. It's portable. It's yes. Uh, it's small. Is it still being used in a lot of facilities? Uh, no. No, it's, it's not being used. Oh. Uh, it, 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 uh, it's a very interesting story. Uh, the, the, the sequel to it. The, the veterinarians loved it. And uh, then... For, their, for, the dog, for their animals. Yes, for the animals. Uh, for the small animal veterinarian. They loved it. And... Uh, uh, the, the uh, as I say, the physical medicine people liked them, but the uh, fellow who took the license to it uh, wasn't a technical person. It was patented and, and licensed by Purdue. He was not a technical person, <clears throat> and everybody wanted something to be added. You ought to add, ought to add uh, uh, respiration. You ought to add heart sounds. You ought to add, uh, 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 let's see, what else was it? They, oh, uh, oxygen sensing. <clears throat> and they, they, they spent a lot of money uh, trying to add things, and, and the addition um, raised the price enormously, and a competitor came in and, and put them out of business. Oh, One another thing that you've been that uh, the center's been involved in is that uh, small intestine submucosa that has. Yes, science. that was an interesting story. <clears throat> we started out the, the project uh, looking for a way to oxygenate blood, and we we decided that. Uh, the intestine is the way to go because it has a large absorbing surface. And so a student and I got a dog and uh, put a tube down this in, through the mouth into the, into the stomach and into the intestine and uh, opened the other end of the dog, the, the, end, the end of the small intestine, and uh, looked at the color of the blood. And we blew oxygen in <coughs> and, uh, and the, the blood turned bright red. The venous blood turned bright red. The, the, uh, uh, the lung work, the, the gut worked as a lung, and the problem with that was that at rest there's very little blood going through the small intestine. When you eat food, uh, there's lots of blood going through. So the amount of blood that would uh, be uh, oxygenated blood that would be added to the circulation uh, when you weren't eating would be very small. So we asked ourselves, uh, what can we do with this big, long, 30 feet of intestine? And I remembered something from physiology that. If you have a, an ulcer in the intestine and it bleeds, it doesn't clot. So we decided that, hey, this would be a good blood vessel because it, 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 has, it has the property of non-clotting property. So uh, we, uh, Badalac was, with, Dr. Badalac was with me at that time. It was in 1984, I think it was. And uh, he was a pathologist and a veterinarian. And he and I, <coughs> and uh, Garrett, Dr. Lance and uh, Art Coffey, who was a medical student at IU at that time, Gary Lance was a veterinarian at Purdue, I said, let's take a piece of the aorta out, uh, down and below the diaphragm, put a piece of the small intestine in. Well, they did it, trimmed it to size, and put it in, and the, the following day, the dog was dead. <clears throat> and uh, they, we opened it up, and the, the abdomen was full of blood. And I said, come on, fellas, let's do some better surgery than that. So they did, did it again, <clears throat> and the same thing happened. And Dr. Badalak got the, the bright idea that, uh, hey, we still had the digestive mucosa present. So he, he took the intestine, everted it, and scraped off the, 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 the mucosa, then re-inverted it, and, and, and stripped off this smooth muscle, and we're left with a sheet of co a tube of collagen. And it's acellular. There are no cell, cells in collagen. And they trimmed it and uh, put it in a, another dog, and the dog lived, and it lived, and it lived. What do we do? And there's two weeks on, we don't know what's going on. The, 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 the graft, graft is patent, we could see it on the x-rays, you know, the fluoroscope, and uh, it was patent. And then we decided not to do anything. We, we'd do some more dogs. 
<coughs> and we uh, did some more dogs, and uh, after about uh, two months, we decided we'd go in and find out what happened. And we could find no trace of the small intestine submucosa, no trace of it at all. And, and uh, it, had, it had converted to, to, arch, uh, to aorta. And it had, it, it had a remark, it has a remarkable property of uh, being, becoming host tissue. It's got growth factors in it that uh, make it possible for it to grow all kinds of uh, tissue. It, we even put a hole in the heart muscle and patched it and it became myocardium. We put a, put a, a, took a piece out, out, went into the brain and took a piece of the coating of, of the covering of the brain called the dura mater and replaced it with the SIS. And it replaced, it, it became dura mater. We, we patched, uh, we put, put a burr hole in the skull and filled it with SIS and it became bone. We, we uh, did uh, ligaments. We, we, we ch ch substituted the SIS for the uh, uh, Achilles tendon and it became tendon and it, be it becomes ligaments. The only place it doesn't remodel is in the central nervous system that's in the brain and spinal cord. Outside of the brain and spinal cord, it'll do everything. It's wonderful skin dressing. It's great for, for burns. And, and for diabetic ulcers and things like that. And uh, they, uh, uh, Lily had a, a, a pathologist down there who was interested, and we, uh, we uh, went down and uh, did, some, uh, did some monkeys down there, re replaced uh, femoral arteries of monkeys, and uh, we uh, sacrificed the animal after about two months and gave the pathologist down there the, the, the uh, they remodeled the artery. He wouldn't believe it. He just wouldn't believe it. He says, this is, this is native artery. He was a histologist. So we did some more, and he was present when, when the surgery was done, and he was present at the examination. And we had him take out the artery, and, and he, he, his name, I've forgotten what his name is now. He, we pub it's published in the Journal of, Journal of Veterinary Pathology. It, sh it showed clearly that two months, it, it's, it's native blood vessel. It, and uh, it, 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 we replaced chunks of the bladder, the urinary bladder, with SIS, and it, it became a, a bladder tissue, and it re -innervated. And, and that means the, the nerves grew in, and, and, and it functioned just like a native bladder. What, uh, for the researchers, what, what is it being used for? Is it being used today? Oh, yes, it's been. It's in a, 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 a about a quarter of a million people have SIS in them. And it, 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 its main use, is, it's not being used for blood vessels, which is the first use we had. Its use is, it's a surgical uh, uh, material used to, to heal wounds. It's used to, uh, uh, it was used to uh, uh, replace the anterior cruciate ligament. It, it, it's, lig it's a ligament repair. Its, it's most uh, frequent use is uh, to repair the, uh, ro the what they call the, uh, uh, the rot rot rotator cuff in the, in the shoulder, the, 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 uh, that's the thing that holds your shoulder in, in its socket, and it's, it's great for that. And that's a pr pretty unusual place because that the joint goes through 360 degrees. All our other joints don't go through that, that many degrees, like here. No, they go 90 degrees, your leg will go 90 degrees, but the, the arm goes through 360 degrees. It's big for that, and it's big for wound dressing. Is it, it's not used for burns, though, at all? Is yes. It, it is? It oh, is yes, 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 yes. So it has multi-uses, then? Yes. Uh -huh. um, any other specific areas of research that you'd like to share with us that were sort of interesting? And also, how sometimes they come about uh, for people, the new people who might be, you know, listening to it? Well, that's that. The, uh, yes, I've got a, a few but, stories. Yeah. Uh, the military one that I, I alluded to a little while ago, uh, Dr. Tacker and I assigned ourselves uh, the task of going to the military to get some money. <clears throat> and uh, we went down to Fort Detrick. Fort Detrick is the biological chemical warfare uh, headquarters. And uh, the general, uh, who, was, who was, at a, he was a pediatrician in private life, he was a two-star general. General Rapman was his name. Uh, we made an appointment to see him. And uh, we, it was one o'clock one afternoon. And we went down to his office and uh, saw his secretary. He said, oh, he won't come. 
And the first thing we knew, his helicopter came from the Pentagon to Fort Detrick, Maryland, and he came in and he says, what can I do for you, gentlemen? I said, General, you've got it wrong. What can we do for you? He looked stunned. He says, sit down. And he says, I have 19 colonels here working for me. Not one of them ever asked me that question. I, I said, I'll tell you. He says, it's the chemical warfare battlefield, he says. We, we cannot communicate with the soldiers on the battlefield. We need to know their physiology. Could you, could you do something? I said, we'll go back. And he said, I got money for it. Yeah, we went back and we designed the, the, the it was a, a monitor that was strapped on the arm and it telemetered the, the information through the, the uh, through the battle the, the, the battlefield suit which is butyl rubber <clears throat> and we we uh, we made put on a de video demonstration on the campus here and uh, Kirk Foster was the soldier in the butyl suit the general couldn't come but he took the uh, the tape of this and we uh, we had a we had a, not only did we, did we make the, the telemetry system for the, uh, for the soldier, we, we, we had a, a, a locating system. You could locate the soldier on the battlefield. And we had a, we had a direction finder. And when the, when the, 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 uh, the uh, telemeter could be acti activated from a distant remote control, it would come on, the direction finder would find him and, and, and tell the telemeter the data to, to, the, to the home station or to the medic if he's close by. And uh, we built uh, uh, 12 of those, and uh, uh, General Ratman, went to, they went to Fort Sam Houston. General Ratman was so excited about it, he took the, uh, the videotape and showed it to Congress, the United States Congress. And uh, the, the thing that happened after that was kind of surprising. Uh, the, 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 there, there are 12 units at Fort Sam still, and uh, General Ratman w was up for promotion as was the uh, colonel who was monitoring our pro project, and he was a Purdue graduate, Colonel Lamoth at Fort Rucker, um, uh, Alabama. And they were both up for promotion, and the, Ar the Army decided that they didn't have a position for a three-star general in the Medical Corps. They didn't have a, a position for a full colonel at Rucker, so they retired both of them. <clears throat> and our champions were gone, and the, pro the project died. Uh, do you ever share any other stories about how someone came about? Do you think of any others? Would you like to share with us? Oh, yes. Uh, I had a lot of projects with Bill Cook. <clears throat> I first met Bill Cook at the uh, American Heart Meeting in 1975. Uh, I was introduced to him, and, and uh, uh, he says, uh, he said, I said, what do you do? And he says, I make catheters. I said, I don't know that. I said, uh, do you make catheters with electrodes? No, I make catheters for intravenous uh, solutions and things like that. And he said, do you have any projects in the, way of, in, in the catheter area? So I said, yes, I, I have, as a matter of fact. He says, uh, uh, I'll, <laughs> he says I'll, Monday I'll send my plane up to, 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 get, to get you from Bloomington to, to Purdue and bring your graduate student down. And, and we went down and we, we, in the meantime we, had, uh, we were working on a method for measuring the output of the heart by uh, measuring the conductivity of blood and you inject a little 5% saline and the conductivity changes, and that conductivity change will tell you the cardiac output. So we went down there and told it to him, and, and he said, uh, how much would it cost to, 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 to get feasibility done? I said, $25,000. And he says, you got it. I thought, this is nonsense. First thing I knew, he, he wrote out a, a check and handed it to me, made it out to me, and I brought it back to Purdue. I said, this is for research. Well, you can't do that kind of a thing, I said. They said, well, I said, I didn't do it, he did it. I want a, a research project. Well, you gotta, have a, you gotta have an application. So I said, I wrote an application, and this all right? Well, you gotta send it to him. <clears throat> so he, he sent, signed it and sent it back, and we started to work on it. And uh, then he, uh, it worked so well, he, he made a, a, created a company uh, in, in Pittsburgh to, to make them. And they made the catheter and the equipment, and it was a commercial product for a while. But it, uh, it ran into competition, severe competition, and he closed, he closed the company. A second run at the carpet. Go ahead, are we okay? He closed that company, and he, uh, he, he uh, called me. This was about, uh, I guess about, 15 years ago, he called me and he said, Les, he says, I understand you're going to be in, in New York. 
uh, at a conference. He said, I'll be there at the same time. Could you bring your, your key people in to meet me at the, the New York Hilton? I said, sure. And we went in and uh, I saw a bottle of Glenlivet on the table. Glenlivet is Highland malt whiskey. It's unblended whiskey. I knew I was in for trouble. <clears throat> and we, he, he poured us drinks and we, we t chatted. I, I said, well, what, what's on your mind, Bill? He says, I bought a pacemaker company <clears throat> and uh, I, I, I want to make the best pacemaker in the world. I said, Bill, you're crazy. And this was at the time when the pacemaker companies were in trouble because they were, they were um, paying kickbacks to surgeons to put in their pacemakers or, and, and they were paying for interns and they were paying for holidays and doing all kinds of bad things. I said, this is a terrible time to do it. He says, I want to make the best pacemaker in the world. And I said, okay. He says, how much will it cost to get feasibility? So I said, 25000 He said, you got it. <clears throat> so we remembered that the venous blood uh, draining a muscle is hotter than the arterial blood because uh, work has been done and oxygen has been consumed. So the venous blood is hotter when you exercise. So I, I quickly figured out that what you do is you put a, a temperature sensor on the catheter that's in the pacing catheter that's in, in the heart and uh, it will detect the uh, increase in temperature and it will speed up the heart by, by an electronic means. So we, we call it uh, Kelvin uh, after the, the, the famous uh, Lord Kelvin, yes, for the, who did the temperature scale. And uh, he, he, built, uh, <clears throat> he built some units and uh, they worked great. We had the clinical trials in Japan. The Japanese uh, didn't have as tight uh, uh, control over their, their patients as they, they do in the United States. And we exercised p patients, <coughs> patients on the treadmill. And we did some dog studies and it worked great on dogs. But there was a surprise when, when the patient exercises, the blood temperature goes down a little bit and then it goes up. And we, we scratched With the pacemaker in. With the pacemaker in, yes. And, uh, and uh, <coughs> we decided, we, we, we tried to figure out why this happened. Well, dogs have fur and people don't have fur. And your skin is about uh, uh, ten, maybe five to seven degrees cooler than your blood. And as soon as you exercise, you get vasodilate, blood vessels dilate and they, 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 they drain this, the skin, the blood that's in the skin. And that's cooler than, than, uh, than the rest of the blood. So the little, drip, <clears throat> little drop in uh, temperature was due to the flushing out the skin and then the temperature rose. And we made it proportional. The more the, more the exercise, the bigger the, the rise and the faster the pacemaker was told to, to, to beat. And it worked great. <clears throat> and the problem was it was a little more expensive pacemaker. Uh, and technology improved and they <coughs> de <coughs> excuse me. <coughs> they, they, they <coughs> excuse me. The cost of the pacemakers uh, uh, went down and Cook's pacemaker uh, couldn't uh, reduce its price because it was too costly to, to, um, to build and uh, he, he, he closed that company and got into another business. Mm -hmm. their pacemakers but but, but 3,000 people had the pacemaker in them. Mm -hmm. yeah, and they're still used. And you, you were talking about a lot of the projects. Let's talk a little bit about funding, how uh, some tips or techniques and was it, did it change over time? Was it easier or hard or, you know, people always... They talk a little bit about that, or they don't. They think it's very hard, or they don't have an idea and where to go and things of that sort. Well, it, you have to think like Willie Sutton. Willie Sutton was a successful bank robber, and they asked him why he robbed banks. He said, "That's where the money is." So, what, what, when you're supporting a research organization in a university, you've got to be attuned to uh, where the money is, and uh, we, as I said, we went to NIH to NSF to NASA <coughs> and to uh, private foundations. And uh, uh, when, I, when we got money from industry, uh, I was criticized very severely in, in the uh, middle 70s, a uh, little late, late 70s, because industry money was, uh, 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 that was just technology, that wasn't basic research. And uh, the people that criticized me uh, that way about 10 years after, they said, oh, but industry's asking more sophisticated questions these days. So the, 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 the people who were my critics uh, decided that they could get money from industry too, and did. <coughs> <coughs> uh, 
And uh, what you have to do is uh, think like Norman Weldon. As I asked Norman Weldon, uh, uh, how do you decide to fund technology? He's a venture capitalist. How do you decide to fund technology? He says, the, the way that I do it, he says, I ask myself, who's going to pay for the device? Is it going to be insurance that pays for it? Is it going to be a customer that pays for it? Or is it some, somebody else? So you have to be a little attuned to uh, where the money is and uh, uh, whether a product will be useful or not. There are lots of things you can make that are interesting, uh, but uh, they may not have a market. So you're, you're, you're walking a tightrope, sort of, in that uh, <coughs> you've got to make something that has scientific merit and it also has a, a technological value to, the, to society. Has it changed as the government? Funding does that changed over time, and the person and the industry is more interested. Is there an, as a source in uh, the years that you've been involved in oh, all your research projects? Yes, yeah, so there there are fads. There there are fads. For example, in this in the uh, uh, let's see, in the middle late seventies, ultrasound was big, and if you if you if you, uh, if you uh, had uh, something that was ultrasound valuable, then you could get money for that. There, there, for example, now, stem cell research is big. The government won't fund it, but industry will fund it. There's some remarkable things going on with stem cells. The SIS got, is, is still going. The CBI, Cook Biotech Incorporated, has, uh, it's, it's almost doubled its uh, uh, personnel, employees, in the last couple of years. And they're, 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 they're going to outgrow the building they have. They've outgrown the, the building twice. And uh, they've, they've hired a lot of them, my former graduates. So it depends uh, if, if something is, is a niche product uh, and, and you can get somebody to, to uh, take it on and sell it. Uh, that's, the, that's what you have to keep in mind. Now, you've gotten a lot of patents, haven't you, all the time? 33. 33. Uh -huh. What was, do you remember how uh, the first one that you got, how that came about? Yes. It's very interesting. Okay. The first one uh, came as a result uh, of Norman Weldon visiting us. He knew me before I knew him. He knew of me, and he came to Purdue. As a matter of fact, it was his urging that, uh, to, the, to the engineering faculty, uh, to Dean Hancock, to have me as the Showalter professor. After I was a professor in 1974, in 1975 in the spring, he, he came down and said, Les, he says, I want you to make a, 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 an automatic implanted defibrillator. And I said, nobody knows how to do that properly. There was, there was one fellow who was doing it, but he, he only used the electrocardiogram to identify the cardiac arrhythmia. And the electrocardiogram tells you nothing about the mechanical activity. And uh, we, we, we decided that our implanted uh, uh, cardiac defibrillator would detect whether the ECG is showing fibrillation and whether the heart is pumping or not. And so we built one and uh, showed it to Norman Weldon and he says, we've got to patent that, Les. And uh, so uh, we patented it and uh, we tried to d get a license, uh, to li license to it, uh, to license it rather. And we tried and uh, it, it, was, it would, at that time, it was too costly to add that to the existing implanted cardioverter defibrillators. So the, the patent just wasn't taken up. And now it is well known by, by industry and, and by cardiologists that you can have an electrocardiogram and no heartbeat, no mechanical beat at all. So the patent is expired. So anybody's free to take that technology now. It, it, it expired 1975, 1995, I guess it was. It, it, uh, the patent is good from two years from the filing date, and we filed it in 1975 or 76, so 95 or 96 it expired. Now anybody's free to use it. On the process, it's a long process, is it not? It, and sometimes you have to revise it or, you know, the patent, working with the patent. Well, the patent is it, it's really very easy. It, it's very easy at Purdue. <clears throat> what you do is you write the, 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 the first draft of the patent, uh, you write the technical uh, component, and then uh, you, you, Purdue will send that to, to, if they think it's a patentable item, they will send that to, the, to the, a, a patent attorney, and he will put it in, or she will put it in a patent language, and, uh, and, and then you'll get the, uh, the, the, the draft back, and you'll iterate back and forward, 
and the attorney wants to wants to make the claims as, as broad as possible. And the claims are are the what 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 you define its use to be, and, and then and then you have to uh, find somebody who will license it. <clears throat> and if you're smart, you'll patent things that are, are very valuable uh, to to society. And if you're not, well, the 33 patents, I think only only three or four of them are licensed, and that's pretty pretty good. Ten percent of the patents are. Or licensed are, are, is a good, good batting average. <coughs> now, there's something else that you should know that's unique in Purdue, and that is uh, the, uh, um, the, the when I came here, the patent pol the patent policy was uh, in, in, in tatters. Uh, the uh, vice president, uh, financial vice president, uh, was his job was to is to uh, prevent the university from going broke. And uh, he, he saw that patents, the royalty from patents are, is a good source of income. But what he forgot about was that you've got to reward creativity. And the royalty uh, uh, scheme in, in, at that time uh, was uh, such that uh, faculty members were taking their ideas out and patenting themselves. And I told uh, the vice president about that. And I told him for five years. And he said, they can't do they can't do I said, yes, they can do that. And your name is Mud. And I've been beating on the table for five years. And he said, well, what must I do? I said, it's simple. Reward creativity. And you reward, re, you reward creativity in three ways. You, you reward the inventors. You, you reward the department or the laboratory of origin. And you reward the university. And I said, a three-way split is what you need. Because the hardest thing in the world in the university is to get unallocated funds. And the, the money that you would give to the department or this school or the uh, laboratory would be un unallocated funds, and the and, and the faculty of that department could apply for funds for feasibility studies. That would get you feasibility studies and get more patents. And the the the, the, the inventors should get a third. If there's one inventor, he would get a third. If if there are two inventors, they'd get two a half of a third each, and so on. And uh, the vice president re redefined what they call B10, uh, which is, was the, the, the university's charter for operating the, the, patent, the patents. And uh, he re re reinterpreted it. And the, the, the uh, royalty uh, scheme is that now. And that, that, that's very attractive. We have one item in clinical trials now. It's a device for measuring, a single device for measuring blood pressure heart rate, respiratory rate, and the oxygen content of your blood in, in neonates and premature infants. Now, neonates and premature infants have uh, um, limbs uh, smaller than your little finger. And, and uh, the smaller they are, it's, it's, the, the better it is for us because the signal is bigger. It's an optical system that reflects light from the, from the tissue bed and it has a little cuff in it and, and, and you wrap it around the, the arm or the leg and it it gives you all of these things. It gives you heart rate and respiratory rate continuously, and it gives you uh, oxygen content continuously, and it gives you blood pressure when you inflate the cuff. And when you inflate the cuff, it, it calibrates itself. And that's, that's licensed to a company, an Indiana company called Theron, and it's, it's in clinical trials in Methodist Hospital now. Mm -hmm. But you did some, you used a lot of the animals in your research. We did it, yes. Right. Yeah, it, 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 the two PhD, and a, and a master's degree and a PhD resulted from the, the dog studies. Right. And, well, the dog and pig studies. We had to get, we had to get weanling piglets to have a, a, a member small enough to, to a tail small enough to uh, uh, simulate a, a premature infant's uh, arms and legs. And we had to especially order the pigs uh, because Piglets eat each other's tails off, and we had to had to have every pig boarded singly so we'd have tails to work on. <laughs> what about that blood pressure? You're going to make a comment on that. that uh... the, the 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 oscillometric method of measuring blood pressure, the one that you just put a cuff on and inflate it and deflate it. We did the the preliminary the, the fundamental studies on that. We did at Baylor, and we we found out that uh, when you inflate the cuff. Uh, and, and up to above systolic pressure and deflate it slowly, you, there are little amp, little pulses of uh, pulses communicated into the air in the cuff, and there's a spectrum that the, the pulses increase, reach a maximum, and decrease. And from that spectrum, uh, 
uh, the, the maximum pressure is uh, the maximum amplitude of oscillations is mean pressure, and there's an algorithm you can use to measure systolic and diastolic. And we published that, and, and uh, I was in uh, the uh, Peachtree uh, Holiday Inn uh, in 1970. Oh, I guess it was 70, 60, no, it was 30 years ago. It was, so it's 1970-something. And I was in, going up in the elevator, and this fellow looked at me, and he looked at my badge, and said, you're Dr. Geddes. I said, yes. He says, I've got something up my, in my room I would like to show you. And uh, I, I said, I thought this my guy was crazy, you know. But I went up to his room, and his name was Maynard Ramsey. He was a physician. And it turns out he was a biomedical engineer also. And he had read our paper and, 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 uh, and decided to build a unit that, that re read out mean blood pressure and uh, uh, heart rate. And he had a, had a friend who was an anesthesiologist. He took it to him. And he wasn't interested at all. Nobody knew what mean pressure was. Mean pressure is that constant pressure equal to the varying pressure. You have a systolic and a diastolic pressure, so the pressure is varying. There's a mean pressure, uh, which is the perfusion pressure. And he decided that, hey, this was a good idea, and I'm going to educate these people. But the way I have to educate these people to, to use this is to figure out how to measure systolic and diastolic pressure, because everybody knows that. So he, he went to a, 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 a dialysis unit in, in Tampa, Florida, where he lives, and he got access to the patients, and he found out to how to convert these amplitude oscillations in the cuff to read out systolic and diastolic pressure. When he did that, it was on his way. And he, he, now, it, now it just shows systolic, diastolic pressure and heart rate. He doesn't display mean pressure because still people don't understand it. And, and he, he it was a great success, and, and when a business, a new business is a great success, it, it's bought, and Johnson & Johnson bought it. Oh, okay. Well, see that down. Um, let's talk a little bit about some of the awards, a couple of ones that you've got, that Outstanding Commercialization Award applied to research. Any, um, just share with us some of your reaction when you get them, when you've gotten that, and also the ones that you got last year, which, you, which you've given the, to the Archives and Special Collection, the, special thing that you got for the award for the um, uh, Heart of Life, which was yeah. Well, when you, when you get an award, you must recognize the old Texas saying, which is that when you see a turtle on a fence post, you know it had a whole lot of help getting there. So you've got to recognize that you, you don't do things by yourself anymore. You, you have uh, uh, talented people with brighter eyes and faster hands and, 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 and more capable hands than yours. Uh, the, the, uh, the, the American Heart Award, uh, the last one, was for the uh, neonatal uh, and premature infant monitoring system that I mentioned a few minutes ago. And, and uh, oh, I, I've, got, I've forgotten the other awards I've had. I've got a few awards. I got an award for, <clears throat> for, the, uh, for the respiration and, and uh, uh, ECG monitor that we did for NASA that I mentioned a little while ago and a few awards for uh, leadership in, in, in research. Uh, some of them cash, by the way, some of them. Some well, of them. That, uh, the outstanding ones, one from Purdue that you got, the Outstanding Commercialization Award, you call it. That was, that was, I think that was for the SIS, right, yeah. small, small Intestine Submucosa. One, that, of the, one of the things I think you could share, you certainly have been involved in a team, and that, that's very, cre very critical, mm -hmm. very important, and I think researchers could benefit by that, that how important it is to have a team and everybody participating. Sometimes it's hard to work in, you know, in, in teams. Some people are not, are not that comfortable in them. But you certainly had a strong uh, impact on team teamwork, working with teams. Well, what 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 I do is I, I, I everybody has to know what the other person does. In other words, uh, they don't have to be able to do the other person's job, but they have to know what 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 it means. For example, I have a research project going now. We've invented a new method of doing cardiopulmonary resuscitation that does not crack ribs. Uh, a rib fracture is a, is a real problem. If you do good CPR, <clears throat> ribs get fractured, and they're painful, and they hurt, you, hurt when you breathe. So we've got a new method, and we're working on it now, and it doesn't, doesn't, it doesn't involve pushing on the chest. We push on the abdomen, and that produces good blood flow. And uh, I've got, uh, I've got, let's see, I've got, uh, 
a, 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 a graduate, uh, a, a double E with a MS in physiology. I've got a, 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 a MS in physiology. I've got uh, two undergraduate engineers. Uh, I've got uh, two vet techs, and uh, and let's see. I think I think that's all. Uh, the vet techs and the vet techs uh, do the surgery and do the anesthesia, but they teach all of the the, the people on, on the team what they're doing. So everybody knows what everybody else is doing, and they all have a task. And, and, and you don't even have to communicate with, with them. They, they, they just, it's like listening to music. They know where, where it's going. And it's a real, real pleasure to, uh, to uh, and they're all work. they're on the same wave, like the yep. same page. Yep, exactly. Okay. And it, it takes time to do that. You have to discipline yourself, but because you, if you're in a hurry to get something done, you tend not to train people. But if you, if you train them, they'll get, you'll get a whole lot more done. A follow-up to that is you've been involved with students all this time, and uh, they've learned a lot. And some have gone on to go to medical school and others. Mm -hmm. and, uh, I, I've taught. very fortunate. I and guess. you're still teaching. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yes, yes. I teach a course called Medical Device Accidents. <clears throat> I've written two books on that, and it's, it's now its fifth, fifth year, I think, of, of operation. It started out with five students, and there was... 18 in the class last year. Uh -huh. do, you, uh, do you teach anything for the medical school students that are here on campus no. for the first two years? No, I don't. Okay. But, but Tacker does. Uh, the, one of the fellows that came with, and Babs does, uh, another fellow that came with me from Baylor. Uh -huh. <clears throat> but I don't teach the medical students. I, I used to at Baylor, but I don't here. Yeah. You have a lot of interaction with the students. And um, now we have, there have been some changes in the center. It used to be the Hill and Brand, but now it's the Weldon School. Yes. Um, and would you share some thoughts on how the center has changed over time since you've come? Over? Well, the, the, uh, in the, retrospect. the, 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 the original uh, was, was the Biomedical Engineering Center. <coughs> and uh, uh, Hill and Brand gave Purdue $400,000 to establish biomedical engineering. And, uh, and he, would not, he was a trustee at that time, a, a Purdue trustee, and he wouldn't let them use his name. Uh, he, he gave it the, the, the amount anonymously. And when I got here, uh, it was, uh, it, there wasn't a center. They named it the, the Biomedical Engineering Center, <clears throat> and Bill Hillenbrand was a good friend of mine, and he wouldn't let his name being used, be used, and, but he, he got brain cancer, and uh, Phil Haas, the uh, provost, decided that the center ought to be named because it, they gave the, the initial money. When I got here, the 400000 was down to 250000 and so Bill allowed his name to be used. Then it became the Hillenbrand Biomedical Engineering Center. <clears throat> and uh, it, we, we, we were specialized in, in one area, in, in the area of cardiovascular research. Mainly, everything was cardiovascular. And uh, um, that was just, uh, we were, we were the, the gem of that, that era. And uh, then when we moved over to uh, a little bit later on, uh, when, when I, after I retired, it became a department of biomedical engineering, and it was headed by George Wodica. Well, he, uh, he, uh, he was a biomedical engineer. He is a biomedical engineer himself, and he decided to, to diversify and get other, than spe other, other specialties in. And so as, it, as the school now has uh, people who are specialized in, in biochemistry, uh, physiology, uh, ultrasound, uh, analytical chemistry, orthopedics, and so on. Uh, 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 so George is uh, making the, the, the school uh, a multidisciplinary school. Mm -hmm. and, it, and it now gives the, it gives the PhD and master's degree and the bachelor's degree. Right. First, the class will graduate in May. The first bachelor's. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yes. Uh, yeah. um, how about any outstanding memory of Purdue that you'd like to share with us? Well, uh, th I guess that the thing I could say is that I, I got more done at Baylor, I mean at Purdue, than I could have done at Baylor. Because uh, the Baylor was a medical school and it, its admission was teaching students and doing research, but uh, they, they, they didn't have the, the breadth of, of, of uh, knowledge that is available at, at Purdue, for example. If I want to know something about <clears throat> um, analytical chemistry, I just pick up the phone and call Fred Rainier or, or um, Graham Cooks. If I want to know something about uh, 
chemical engineering, or I could call uh, the, over the chemical engineering. So the, the resources here are much, much more than, than I had at, at Baylor, and I used the resources. And the, the collaboration develops as, as a result of these friendships that you get from uh, the, the people you tap on the shoulder for resources. And the collaboration, right? Yes, uh-huh. Uh -huh. Is there anything that, I, that you'd like to share that I may have forgotten to ask? Anything in the, kind of a summary thing? Anything special that you'd like to? Yes, uh, the, 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 Dr. Jiske, in his short tenure here, he's going to retire in June, has uh, changed the, the, the face of research. Uh, he, he's, his philosophy is, is, is great for, for a researcher. Uh, and he, he, he encourages research. <clears throat> he uh, uh, encourages research to, to be directed to the benefit of society. And that has, that has been the big change at Purdue, and it's been it's been a pleasant change because <clears throat> you, you 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 get support for doing things that that uh, have a, a quick benefit to society, and that 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 I didn't have at, at Baylor. Mm -hmm. Anything else you'd like to say in closing? Anything special that you'd like to to share with us? No, right. uh, I'm still teaching, still doing research. And right, very busy still. since you uh, exactly. Yeah. Pardon? You've been very busy. Yes, and I, I am. I've always been busy. That's right. My, my research is my hobby. I have another career, by the way. <clears throat> I'm an expert witness. I'm a, I'm a fellow of the National Academy of Forensic Engineers, and I handle medical device accidents for, for lawyers. Been in court several times, gave de depositions several times, and this is a source of material for my medical device accidents course. Mm -hmm. okay. uh, 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 I think that sort of sums it up. Dr. Uh, Geddes, we want to thank you very much for sharing all of this. It means a lot to the researchers who will be using it. Thank you for the opportunity. Thank you. Okay.